How to Succeed, or Stepping Stones to Fame and Fortune, by Orison Sweat Marden. Chapter 8. The Conquest of Obstacles. Nature, when she adds difficulties, adds brains. Emerson. Exigencies create the necessary ability to meet and conquer them. Wendell Phillips. Many men owe the grandeur of their lives to their tremendous difficulties. Spurgeon. The rugged metal of the mine must burn before its surface shine. Byron. When a man looks through a tear in his own eye, that is a lens which opens reaches in the unknown and reveals orbs no telescope could do. Beecher No man ever worked his way in a dead calm. John Neal Kites rise against, not with, the wind. Then welcome each rebuff that turns earth's smoothness rough, each sting that bids nor sit nor stand, but go. Browning What a fine profession ours would be if there were no gibbets, said one of two highwaymen who chanced to pass a gallows. Tut, tut, ye blockhead, replied the other. Gibbets are the making of us, for if there were no gibbets, everyone would be a highwayman. Just so, with every art, trade, or pursuit. It is the difficulties that scare and keep out unworthy competitors. Life, says a philosopher, refuses to be so adjusted as to eliminate from it all strife and conflict and pain. There are a thousand tasks that, in larger interests than ours, must be done, whether we want them or no. The world refuses to walk upon tiptoe so that we may be able to sleep. It gets up very early and stays up very late. And all the while there is the conflict of myriads of hammers and saws and axes with the stubborn material that in no other way can be made to serve its use and do its work for man. And then, too, these hammers and axes are not wielded without strain or pang but swung by the millions of toilers who labor with their cries and groans and tears. Nay, our temple building, whether it be for God or man, exacts its bitter toll and fills life with cries and blows. The thousand rivalries of our daily business, the fierce animosities when we are beaten, the even fiercer exultation when we have beaten, the crashing blows of disaster, the piercing scream of defeat. These things we have not yet gotten rid of, nor in this life ever will. Why should we wish to get rid of them? We are here, my brother, to be hewed and hammered and planed in God's quarry and on God's anvil for a nobler life to come. Only the muscle that is used is developed. Troubles are often the tools by which God fashions us for better things, said Beecher. Far up the mountainside lies a block of granite, and says to itself, How happy am I in my serenity! Above the winds, above the trees, almost above the flight of birds, here I rest age after age, and nothing disturbs me. Yet what is it? It is only a bare block of granite, shutting out of the cliff, and its happiness is the happiness of death. By and by comes the miner, and with strong and repeated strokes he drills a hole in its top, and the rock says, What does this mean? Then the black powder is poured in, and with a blast that makes the mountain echo, the block is blown asunder, and goes crashing down into the valley. Ah, it exclaims as it falls, why this rending? Then come saws to cut and fashion it, and humbled now, and willing to be nothing, it is borne away from the mountain and conveyed to the city. Now it is chiseled and polished, 
till at length, finished in beauty, by block and tackle it is raised, with mighty hoistings, high in the air, to be the top stone on some monument of the country's glory. It is this scantiness of means, this continual deficiency, this constant hitch, this perpetual struggle to keep the head above water and the wolf from the door, that keeps society from falling to pieces. Let every man have a few more dollars than he wants, and anarchy would follow. Do you wish to live without a trial? asks a modern teacher. Then you wish to die but half a man. Without trial you cannot guess at your own strength. Men do not learn to swim on a table. They must go into deep water and buffet the waves. Hardship is the native soil of manhood and self-reliance. Trials are rough teachers, but rugged schoolmasters make rugged pupils. A man who goes through life prosperous and comes to his grave without a wrinkle is not half a man. Difficulties are God's errands, and when we are sent upon them, we should esteem it a proof of God's confidence. We should reach after the highest good. Suddenly, with much jarring and jolting, an electric car came to a standstill just in front of a heavy truck that was headed in an opposite direction. The huge truck wheels were sliding uselessly round on the car tracks that were wet and slippery from rain. All the urging of the teamster and the straining of the horses were in vain until the motorman quietly tossed a shovelful of sand on the track under the heavy wheels, and then the truck lumbered on its way. Friction is a very good thing, remarked a passenger. There is a beautiful tale of Scandinavian mythology. A hero, under the promise of becoming a demigod, is bidden in the celestial halls to perform three test acts of prowess. He is to drain the drinking horn of Thor. Then he must run a race with a courser so fleet that he fairly spurns the ground under his flying footsteps. Then he must wrestle with a toothless old woman whose sinewy hands, as wiry as eagle claws in the grapple, make his very flesh to quiver. He is victorious in them all. But as the crown of success is placed upon his temples, he discovers for the first time that he has had for his antagonist the three greatest forces of nature. He raced with thought. He wrestled with old age. He drank the sea. Nature, like the god of nature, wrestles with us as a friend, not an enemy, wanting us to gain the victory, and wrestles with us that we may understand and enjoy her best blessings. Every greatest and highest earthly good has come to us unfolded and enriched by this terrible wrestling with nature. A curious society still exists in Paris, composed of dramatic authors who meet once a month and dine together. Their number has no fixed limit. Only every member to be eligible must have been hissed. An eminent dramatist is selected for chairman and holds the post for three months. His election generally follows close upon a splendid failure. Some of the world-famous ones have enjoyed this honor. Dumas, Jr., Zola, and Offenbach have all filled this chair and presided at the monthly dinner. These dinners are given on the last Friday of the month and are said to be extraordinarily hilarious. I do believe God wanted a grand poem of that man, said George MacDonald of Milton, and so blinded him that he might be able to write it. Quote, returned with thanks, unquote, has made many an author. Failure often leads a man to success by arousing his latent energy, by firing a dormant purpose, by awakening powers which were sleeping. Men of metal turn disappointments into helps, as the oyster turns into pearls the sand which annoys it. 
Let the adverse breath of criticism be to you only what the blast of the storm wind is to the eagle, a force against him that lifts him higher. I do not see, says Emerson, how any man can afford, for the sake of his nerves and his nap, to spare any action in which he can partake. It is pearls and rubies to his discourse. Drudgery, calamity, exasperation, want, are instructors in eloquence and wisdom. The true scholar grudges every opportunity of action passed by as a loss of power. Adversity is a severe instructor, says Edmund Burke, set over us by one who knows us better than we do ourselves as he loves us better, too. He that wrestles with us strengthens our nerves and sharpens our skill. Our antagonist is our helper. This conflict with difficulty makes us acquainted with our object and compels us to consider it in all its relations. It will not suffer us to be superficial. Strong characters, like the palm tree, seem to thrive best when most abused. Men who have stood up bravely under great misfortune for years are often unable to bear prosperity. Their good fortune takes the spring out of their energy, as the torrid zone enervates races accustomed to a vigorous climate. Some people never come to themselves until baffled, rebuffed, thwarted, defeated, crushed in the opinion of those around them. Trials unlock their virtues. Defeat is the threshold of their victory. Every man who makes a fortune has been more than once a bankrupt, if the truth were known, says Albion Tourget. Grant's failure as a subaltern made him commander-in-chief, and for myself, my failure to accomplish what I set out to do led me to what I never had aspired to. What is defeat? asked Wendell Phillips. Nothing but education. And a life's disaster may become the landmark from which there has begun a new era, a broader life for man. To make his way at the bar, said an eminent jurist, a young man must live like a hermit and work like a horse. There is nothing that does a young lawyer so much good as to be half starved. We are the victors of our opponents. They have developed in us the very power by which we overcome them. Without their opposition, we could never have braced and anchored and fortified ourselves, as the oak is braced and anchored for its thousand battles with the tempests. Our trials, our sorrows, and our griefs develop us in a similar way. Obstacles, says Mitchell, are great incentives. I lived for whole years upon Virgil and found myself well off. Poverty, Horace tells us, drove him to poetry. Nothing more unmans a man than to take away from him the spur of necessity which urges him onward and upward to the goal of his ambition. Man is naturally lazy and wealth induces indolence. The great object of life is development, the unfolding and drawing out of our powers, and whatever tempts us to a life of indolence or inaction, or to seek pleasure merely, whatever furnishes us a crutch when we can develop our muscles better by walking, all helps, guides, props, whatever tempts a life of inaction, in whatever guise it may come, is a curse. I always pity the boy or girl with inherited wealth, for the temptation to hide their talents in a napkin, undeveloped, is very, very great. It is not natural for them to walk when they can ride, to go alone when they can be helped. Quentin Matsys was a blacksmith at Antwerp, when in his twentieth year he wished to marry the daughter of a painter. The father refused his consent. Wert thou a painter, said he, she should be thine, but a blacksmith, 
Never. I will be a painter, said the young man. He applied his new art with so much perseverance that in a short time he produced pictures which gave a promise of the highest excellence. He gained for his reward the fair hand for which he sighed, and rose ere long to a high rank in his profession. Take two acorns from the same tree, as nearly alike as possible. Plant one on a hill by itself, and the other in a dense forest, and watch them grow. The oak standing alone is exposed to every storm. Its roots reach out in every direction, clutching the rocks and piercing deep into the earth. Every rootlet lends itself to steady the growing giant, as if in anticipation of fierce conflict with the elements. Sometimes its upward growth seems checked for years, but all the while it has been expending its energy in pushing a root against a large rock to gain a firmer anchorage. Then it shoots proudly aloft again, prepared to defy the hurricane. The gales which sport so rudely with its wide branches find more than their match, and only serve still further to toughen the very minutest fiber from pith to bark. The acorn planted in the deep forest shoots up a weak, slender sapling. Shielded by its neighbors, it feels no need of spreading its roots far and wide for support. Take two boys, as nearly alike as possible. Place one in the country away from the hothouse culture and refinements of the city, with only the district school, the Sunday school, and a few books. Remove wealth and props of every kind, and if he has the right kind of material in him, he will thrive. Every obstacle overcome lends him strength for the next conflict. If he falls, he rises with more determination than before. Like a rubber ball, the harder the obstacle he meets, the higher he rebounds. Obstacles and opposition are but apparatus of the gymnasium in which the fibers of his manhood are developed. He compels respect and recognition from those who have ridiculed his poverty. Put the other boy in a Vanderbilt family. Give him French and German nurses. Gratify every wish. Place him under the tutelage of great masters and send him to Harvard. Give him thousands a year for spending money, and let him travel extensively. The two meet. The city lad is ashamed of his country brother. The plain, threadbare clothes, hard hands, tawny face, and awkward manner of the country boy make sorry contrast with the genteel appearance of the other. The poor boy bemoans his hard lot, regrets that he has, quote, no chance in life, unquote, and envies the city youth. He thinks that it is a cruel providence that places such a wide gulf between them. They meet again as men, but how changed! It is as easy to distinguish the sturdy, self-made man from the one who has been propped up all his life by wealth, position, and family influence, as it is for the shipbuilder to tell the difference between the plank from the rugged mountain oak and one from the sapling of the forest. If you think there is no difference, place each plank in the bottom of a ship and test them in a hurricane at sea. The athlete does not carry the gymnasium away with him, but he carries the skill and muscle which gave him his reputation. The lessons you learn at school will give you strength and skill in afterlife, and power just in proportion to the accuracy, the clearness of perception with which you learn your lessons. The school was your gymnasium. You do not carry away the Greek and Latin textbooks, the geometry and algebra into your occupations any more than the athlete carries the apparatus of the gymnasium. But you carry away the skill and the power if you have been painstaking, accurate, and faithful. It is in me, and it shall come out. And it did. 
for Richard Brinsley Sheridan became the most brilliant, eloquent, and amazing statesman of his day. Yet, if his first efforts had been but moderately successful, he might have been content with mere mediocrity. It was his defeats that nerved him to strive for eminence and win it. But it took hard, persistent work in his case to secure it, just as it did in that of so many others. Byron was stung into a determination to go to the top by a scathing criticism of his first book, Hours of Idleness, published when he was but nineteen years of age. Macaulay said, There is scarce an instance in history of so sudden a rise to so dizzy an eminence as Byron reached. In a few years he stood by the side of such men as Scott, Southey, and Campbell. Many an orator like stuttering Jack Curran, or Orator Mum, as he was once called, has been spurred into eloquence by ridicule and abuse. Where the sky is gray and the climate unkindly, where the soil yields nothing save to the diligent hand, and life itself cannot be supported without incessant toil, Man has reached his highest range of physical and intellectual development. The most beautiful and the strongest animals, as a rule, have come from the same narrow belt of latitude which has produced the heroes of the world. The most beautiful, as well as the strongest characters, are not developed in warm climates, where a man finds his bread ready-made on trees, and where exertion is a great effort but rather in a trying climate and on a stubborn soil. It is no chance that returns to the Hindu riot a penny and to the American laborer a dollar for his daily toil, that makes Mexico with her mineral wealth poor and New England with its granite and ice rich. It is rugged necessity. It is the struggle to obtain. It is poverty, the priceless spur, that develops the stamina of manhood, and calls the race out of barbarism. Labor found the world a wilderness, and has made it a garden. The law of adaptation by which conditions affect an organism is simple and well known. It is that which calluses the palm of the oarsman, strengthens the waist of the wrestler, fits the back to its burden, it inexorably compels the organism to adapt itself to its conditions, to like them, and so to survive them. As soon as young eagles can fly, the old birds tumble them out and tear the down and feathers from their nest. The rude and rough experience of the eaglet fits him to become the bold king of birds, fierce and expert in pursuing his prey. Benjamin Franklin ran away, and George Law was turned out of doors. Thrown upon their own resources, they early acquired the energy and skill to overcome difficulties. Boys who are bound out, crowded out, kicked out, usually turn out, while those who do not have these disadvantages frequently fail to come out. From an aimless, idle, and useless brain, emergencies often call out powers and virtues before unknown and unsuspected. How often we see a young man develop astounding ability and energy after the death of a parent or the loss of a fortune, or after some other calamity has knocked the props and crutches from under him. The prison has roused the slumbering fire in many a noble mind. Robinson Crusoe was written in prison. The Pilgrim's Progress appeared in Bedford Jail. The Life and Times of Baxter, Eliot's Monarchia of Man, and Penn's No Cross, No Crown were written by prisoners. Sir Walter Raleigh wrote the history of the world during his imprisonment of thirteen years. Luther translated the Bible while confined in the castle of Wartburg. For twenty years Dante worked in exile, 
and even under sentence of death. His works were burned in public after his death, but genius will not burn. Adversity exasperates fools, dejects cowards, draws out the faculties of the wise and industrious, puts the modest to the necessity of trying their skill, awes the opulent, and makes the idle industrious. Neither do uninterrupted success and prosperity qualify men for usefulness and happiness. The storms of adversity, like those of the ocean, rouse the faculties, and excite the invention, prudence, skill, and fortitude of the voyager. The martyrs of ancient times, embracing their minds to outward calamities, acquired a loftiness of purpose and a moral heroism worth a lifetime of softness and security. A man upon whom continuous sunshine falls is like the earth in August. He becomes parched and dry and hard and close-grained. Men have drawn from adversity the elements of greatness. If you have the blues, go and see the poorest and sickest families within your knowledge. The darker the setting, the brighter the diamond. Don't run about and tell acquaintances that you have been unfortunate. People do not like to have unfortunate men for acquaintances. This is the crutch age. Helps and aids are advertised everywhere. We have institutes, colleges, universities, teachers, books, libraries, newspapers, magazines. Our thinking is done for us. Our problems are all worked out in explanations and keys. Our boys are too often tutored through college with very little study. Short roads and abridged methods are characteristic of the century. Ingenious methods are used everywhere to get the drudgery out of the college course. Newspapers give us our politics and preachers our religion. Self-help and self-reliance are getting old-fashioned. Nature, as if conscious of delayed blessings, has rushed to man's relief with her wondrous forces, and undertakes to do the world's drudgery and emancipate him from Eden's curse. End of chapter 8 Recording by David Martin